Love this podcast? Support this show through the ACAST supporter feature. It's up to you how much you give, and there's no regular commitment. Just click the link in the show description to support now. Let's talk hydration. See, I carry something to drink with me every single place that I go because I am concerned about being dehydrated. It runs in the family. Everything from dry mouth, dizzy spells, fainting, it's pretty serious. And I've tried all the different types of waters and sports drinks. Let me tell you something right now. Liquid IV. That has been the most efficient at keeping me hydrated and doing so pretty quickly. Okay, Liquid IV has five essential vitamins and is two times faster at keeping you hydrated than water alone. And I'm serious, man. Everything from vitamin C to vitamins B3, B5, B6, B12... Liquid IV also is non-GMO, so it's free from gluten, dairy, soy. So for all you folks out there with food allergies, this may be right up your alley. And I know what you're thinking, but how does it taste, Duke? Well, it tastes pretty good. Okay, we're talking my favorite in pina colada. They also have tropical punch, strawberry, new flavors like sea berry and strawberry lemonade. Huh. You can enjoy this stuff, man, but don't take my word for it. I want you to stop what you're doing right now and head over to liquidiv.com. Use the promo code Duke Loves Wrestling so you get 20% off your entire order. I mean, anything that you order on liquidiv.com. So what are you waiting for? It's time for you to shop better hydration today. Use the promo code Duke Loves Wrestling over at liquidiv.com. Save yourself 20%. Stay hydrated. Most importantly, enjoy life. That's right. You are locked in. Look at what we have here, folks. To the only show that matters. The cream of the crop. Duke loves wrestling. And there is no one that does it better than your host. I have come here to chew bubble gum and kick ass. The Duke. And I'm all out of bubble gum. Brothers and sisters, you know that when our main man, Rob the Genius, is on Duke Loves Wrestling, we're going to get plenty of facts. We are going to get plenty of difference of perspective. I don't know about difference of opinion so much as difference of perspective. Doesn't mean anyone's right. Doesn't mean anyone's wrong. Although uh, I take that back. It means I'm right and he's wrong. <laughs> um, but other than that, though, it's it's very clear that Everyone out there enjoys when Rob the Genius is on the show because you're going to get a level of discussion supported by fact that is so off the charts. It's very difficult to you may not like it. You may not agree with it, but you can't dispute the fact that, you know, when Rob comes on and he starts laying down the facts, it is what it is, man. That's just the truth. So without further ado, welcome back. Rob, the G- you know, Rob, I'm going to have to, like, get you your own room uh, in, in a secret location here because you might as well just live here at this point, man. <laughs> hey, man, it's always good to be that welcome where you can come back and show up at any time. And, you know, like on uh, Cheers when Norm used to walk in the bar and everybody like, Norm. <laughs> hey, it's, you know it's Cheers always- in Boston. You know Cheers yeah. in Boston, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So <laughs> always good to be that welcome. You know, well, you certainly are. And it's funny, Rob, because I got all these Hall of Famers and all these legends that come on the show. And, you know, these indie kids who are making a name for themselves. You're you're just you are in just as much demand as a lot of them are, um, which is truly I, I got to be honest with you. It's it's fascinating to see that because, you know, you and I are just a couple of lifelong wrestling fans. That's right. But there's something about the quality of conversation that we bring out of each other that people just really enjoy, man. So, and I kudos to you. You you bring out the best of me, even when I'm acting my most uh, ridiculous, for sure. Well, thank you, man. And uh, look, at, hey, I always enjoy doing this, and it's like I said, it's, it's good to know that people like what we do, man. Indeed, indeed. Speaking of which, I mean, I a lot has happened um, since the last time you were on, and I've purposely held my opinion on the show 
because I figured at some point soon, you know, Rob is going to come back on and we can kind of peel back the layers on some of this stuff. So I, I want to jump into something that's very, very topical, and that is AEW Fight Forever. The, the video game that they announced they were in the process of, of developing back in 2020, it has finally come out so people can purchase it right now. We've seen people playing it. The reviews have come out. The reviews have not been that great. You know, on average, they've gotten just over 50%, somewhere around the 60% range on, on a scale of uh, 100 or on a scale of 1 to 10. So, you know, the, although people enjoy it from an entertainment standpoint to a certain degree, th- there's definitely a lot to be desired, unfortunately, which is which is crazy for a game that has been in development for over three years. Um, you're a gamer. Yeah. What's your impression of AEW Fight Forever thus far? OK, well, now I have not played it, so I can't give you like a, I can't give you a first person kind of take on that. But... Again, you know, I think uh, the one review I saw gave it six out of ten. Um, now, from what I've read about it, I mean, it, it has it has some features that sound interesting and that are different than what you get from the WWE game. I'll give them points for doing that. I think it's always good to in, to introduce concepts that either have not been introduced or that have been left on the shelf for a while. I think that's a good thing, regardless. Uh, I think the people who make the WWE game should, well, they, they look, they are taking notes and seeing what they can incorporate into 2K24 to see if there's anything, you know, just interesting. Um, the same way, look, when the, when the XFL first came around back in, what was it, like 99 or 2000, and people, a lot of people, football people crapped all over the quality of their football product and all of that stuff, but the NFL ultimately did find some things to incorporate into their presentation from it. So um, I think the people who make the WWE game will do that, or they, they're they definitely looking at it at least. Um, now, I have no idea how well this thing is selling. Um, and for them, we know that it was a big financial undertaking. So the process of making this game is definitely a failure <laughs> now, regardless of how the game does. Right. The process was horrible from everything we learned. Um, it took them three years and it cost way more money than it should have. And I've even said in a couple of places that they should have just signed a licensing deal for their characters and likenesses with some company who was already making a game and just go from there and let them, you know, make the game and it would have cost them a lot less money. Um, look, Kenny Omega is a gamer. You know, he, he's a gamer's gamer, right? I mean, he's an expert at playing video games. Um, doesn't mean he should have been tasked with, you know, helping develop one, right? I mean, and just like, I mean, you know, over in WWE, Xavier Woods is, you know, he knows about everything there's no about playing a video game. Um, but that doesn't mean you should have, you know, that doesn't mean the WWE would call him to design one. Right. Um, so I think that didn't help and we'll see how well it does, how well it sells. Uh, for one, look, I don't, you know, I, as, as critical as I am of Tony Khan and AEW, I do not root for their failure. I do not gloat when something doesn't go right for them. Um, because look, if you're, you know, look, I'm an old union officer or I was at one time. If, you know, when you want the best possible business situation for the, the labor and the best possible situation for the labor and for the talent, for the wrestlers, is there to be as many options as possible that can pay them well. Okay. And so whether you like Tony Khan or dislike Tony Khan, whatever you think about Tony Khan, um, it is good for the wrestlers, for AEW to succeed and for all of their adventures to succeed. So I hope that this thing does. Now, again, going back to the issue of licensing versus making your own game, um, I think, yeah, well, the other thing is, the problem is that 
Now, the one thing people are saying that the um, they don't have like the creator wrestler options that the WWE game does, and that puts them behind the eight ball because every AEW wrestler you could basically find has already been created to play on WWE 2K and all of the sets for all of the shows. Um, so that immediately puts them behind the eight ball because if if I want to play. Because obviously, look, if you if you love pro wrestling and you watch different companies and all this thing, then you want to you know you want to be able to play WWE people versus AEW people and versus New Japan people and all that kind of stuff. And if you can do all that on WWE 2K, then there isn't a whole lot of incentive to even buy the AEW game unless you're just somebody who is a kind of a completionist, right? And how they collect things. Um, so they put themselves behind a pretty big eight ball. And you know, that's a that's a great. That's a great perspective there, Rob. And I didn't even think about that, but you're absolutely right. If if you're somebody who is a big wrestling fan and you're a gamer, um, being able to have your quote unquote dream matches, your favorite wrestlers of all time, current, past, in between, being able to put them in the ring against each other and see who's going to win and who's going to lose, that's a that's a major part of the whole fantasy experience. And and certainly when you have video games that allow you to create wrestlers, then you can make those dream match scenarios. And unfortunately, AEW Fight Forever does not provide that experience like WWE 2K does. So that's a that's a major disadvantage. So you, you've you narrowed your audience, your potential customers to a certain degree um, because of that, where the people who are going to buy AEW Fight Forever are especially at full price, which is right now, they're AEW fans. They're people who, generally speaking, watch the product, know the product, follow the product, are already spending money on the product. And there's only so many of those. So, you know, on the secondary wave here, which when we get later into the summer, going into the early fall, we start thinking about the holiday season. That's when you're really going to see how well this game does. Because how many casual gamers are they going to be able to get sales off of? And I don't know. I really don't know. I I mean, like we said, there's a lot of money that's been spent on this game. This game has put AEW in debt because of the amount of money that's been spent on it. And that's not that's not an opinion. That's a fact. According to the owner of All Elite Wrestling, Shad Khan, Tony Khan's uh, daddy, a.k.a. Big Papa, a.k.a. Shoddy Shoddy. We like the party. Um According to him, the company would, would would be profitable had it not been for the investment in this video game, AEW Fight Forever. That's a big deal. So to see the lukewarm reviews of the game and the fact that a lot of the reviewers say that you're going to get bored pretty easily, that's a concern. Now, let's put a positive spin on this. I think that one of the game features that allegedly exists, and I haven't played the game yet like you haven't, Rob, although I have watched countless reviews and gameplays and things like that in order to form my opinion. I've done my research. Um, the option to have essentially a battle royal where players can go online and play against each other all in the ring at the same time, that's a big deal. Yes. So it, I, I think the figure was something like 16 people can be in the ring at the same time or something like that. If that, in fact, is a feature, that's definitely something that WWE 2K does not have. That feature alone may be enough to carry the game uh, in, a, in a special way, especially if they continue to update that feature. So I'm really hoping that that's the case because, man, if that's if that's what's going on, then hopefully AEW can recoup some of that investment. In a perfect world, they'd be able to get all their money back and make a profit. I don't know if that's going to happen, but they can at least recoup some of that investment. So, you know, we'll see on that. But here we go again where Tony Khan is taking chances too soon, making grandiose promises too soon, as opposed to solidifying the company, solidifying the brand, and just focusing on the thing that it's supposed to be able to do more than anything else, which is provide a a solid wrestling product consistently, you know? So Tony, I'm sure you're listening. 
it's time to stop investing in all these little side projects and things like that because you haven't even solidified your wrestling. CM Punk is legitimately the only property that you have right now that's strong enough to make a significant difference from a standpoint of ticket sales, uh, viewing audience, and overall buzz, consistent buzz. That's a problem. An old beat-up wrestler who is temperamental and at any point will just walk out or beat up or, or get into physical altercations with executives, that's not somebody who you want to rest your laurels on. That's not somebody who you want to, you know, depend on in terms of bringing your company to the next level. That's somebody that you got to be very concerned about because they, if they hold all the cards, they can just take their, their ball and go home at any point. You need to make and develop new stars, real stars. And this whole nonsense of not having black and brown folk as top contenders for the AEW World Championship, the fact that you still have not built anyone up who is a person of color, who is in that discussion consistently, they are at least top five. They are an option that could take on the world champion and few with the world champion long term that could that fans can look at and say, yes, that person could beat the world champion. The fact that you don't have that, I believe, is crushing the, the, the company financially on various fronts. It's crushing them from a standpoint of being able to, to get more advertising dollars. It's crushing them from a standpoint of being able to market the company in the media. It's crushing the company in, from the standpoint of growing their audience, which has been significantly stagnant, as we've seen with every metric, including the quote unquote ratings. Um, so these are issues that have to be addressed that are far more important than putting together some vanity project video game. Yeah, and now let me say because we, we do talk about ratings a lot, and I, I know, and we've talked about the issues with the rating system. Now, what I've always maintained though is that one thing the rating system is good for is comparing, you know, yesterday's numbers to last year's numbers, right? Because as flawed as the system is, up is up and down is down still, and. If you're up from last year, that's good, regardless of the methodology. If you're down from last year, it's bad. If you're flat, it's, you know, depending on what, what you're looking at, it could be good or bad. And now in their case, uh, they are, generally speaking, they are down from last year. CM Punk makes a difference. Now, as far as now, if we're going to talk about people of color, now, it's not as simple as, well, just push the black people, right? No, I mean, but Ricky Stark, for example, has proven himself in that environment to be somebody they could go with. And, that, that, you know, they have him in this feud with Bullet Club Gold, and um, if he doesn't emerge from that in some type of better fashion, then, you know, then, then I would tell him that when his contract was up, he needs to be on the first train to Stanford. Okay. Um, another guy, um, you know, um, Powerhouse Hobbs, same thing. I mean, like, what are they doing with him? I mean, um, he's another if, guy. If Powerhouse Hobbs, a guy who got knocked out by Orange Cassidy and pinned in less than 10 seconds, if Powerhouse Hobbs was pushed the same way Orange Cassidy has been pushed, this guy would absolutely be in the world title picture. Right. And there's some hope for him because apparently he is one of Punk's guys or he's a guy that Punk is definitely he's taking a liking to. Um, so, I mean, there's some hope for him with Punk being around. But beyond that, um, he's another guy um, when his contract is up, he should be on the first he should be on the first trade in Stanford. Um, oh, and that's that's if Stanford is even interested in either one of them, unfortunately, because they should be. One, one I mean, thing the WWE has proven is that they they can find stars of color, develop them, and turn them into superstars. Especially over the past three four years, they 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 have not missed <laughs> when it comes to doing that, right? And they should absolutely look. Those are two guys. They should absolutely want to get both of those guys. Okay, 
Um, I'm, I'm not. I got to stop you there for a second, Rob. You can convince me on Ricky Starks, and I've been singing his praises since before the NWA when, when Ricky Starks and Keith Lee were tearing it up on the Texas Indies with their feud against each other. I always felt that both of those guys were, were special. Uh, unfortunately, Keith Lee didn't work out. Starks yeah. hasn't gotten the opportunity yet. But I'm going to tell you something. I am losing my confidence in Powerhouse Hobbs because uh-huh. I, I just do not believe him. I don't see this guy, and certainly in his rhetoric that we that we see publicly, he's not even pushing to be given more. He's not even pushing for a better opportunity. The guy's comfortable in whatever he's getting. Well, then if that's the case, then well, then then that's on him. Um, so you can't you you're not going to survive in the WWE no, when you're not. a person that's just satisfied for whatever crumbs the the indie promotion gives you. No, you're not. Uh, that's true. Um, so then, and if that's the case, then well, then that then that's on him. Then um, and um, but it's it is absolutely the way they've done Ricky Starks over since he's been there. It's just like, come on, man. Um, so him and, definitely, and, and for and for you fans out there who are going to take issue with what Rob is saying there, I, I get it. You can say, well, our preference is 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 everybody else who's been pushed. But here's the problem. How long are we going to continue to have this this useless Orange Cassidy, uh, Darby Allen, Jungle Boy? How long are we going to continue to see mediocre folks like that continue to be pushed in the manner that they are when you have somebody like a, like a Ricky Starks who Arn Anderson even said, you know, Ricky Starks carries himself like a top guy. Yeah. And what he means by that is Ricky Starks is constantly pitching ideas. He's constantly begging for more he's constantly when he's put in positions delivering in terms of his quality of wrestling what he does on the mic interest that he's generating so so this isn't a, this isn't a, a situation where the talent is not doing what they're supposed to do this is the company choosing other people over them now we'll push back a little bit because look i think orange cassidy is pretty popular for them I'm not going to sit here and say they should not push Orange Cassidy. Well, Jesus right. Christ, I'd be popular too if I were, if I got the investment that Orange Cassidy got. If if, but, uh, if you give me all the merch and you and you give me a cool song and you and you tell the well, world sure, that I'm but, special, but, I'm well, going to let me just say that. this. Let me say, okay, Orange Cassidy won me over. Okay, I was not inclined to be an Orange Cassidy fan, but I've been watching him during this whole run with the with America's title, and it has been very interesting and very engaging. All right, now. As far as what he did before that, you know, I was indifferent, you know, but this, I, I will say that this particular run that he's been on has been, to me, has been pretty interesting, pretty engaging. Uh, but how much of that is the talent and how much of that is the opportunity? If you take both. Orange Cassidy out, would you not be able to generate the same interest, if not more, with the Darby Allen? Um, I mean, I think you. I think there's space for both of them. I think now, if you want to, now if you want to say somebody who, I think has been wasted time, I would say Jungle Boy. <laughs> um, uh, if you want to point to wasted time, I would say I would point to Jungle Boy. I would not push. I would not point to Darby Allen or to Orange Cassidy. Um, I would point to Jungle Boy. I would. There are a few other people there. I would uh, point to and say that those folks were a waste of time. Well, when you put the, when you put all those guys in a main event. Uh, against MJF, who's another one, it, it it fell flat. You know this. What was it? The pillars, the four pillars match. Yeah, and I think that was that was an example of Tony Khan copying something from all Japan without understanding, you know, what it is. I mean, that that was a moniker in all Japan that was earned by those f- four guys. I don't even know who they are, but that was earned by those four guys through their performances. And Tony Khan just kind of slapped it on four people because, you know, he's like, well, we need a, um, you know, we need our own four pillars. Um, you know. Um, a bunch of undersized white guys who have been given the world and still they can't get over. I mean, MJF, let's call it what it is. As world champion, it has not been a successful run. In fact, AEW has experienced their biggest downturn with MJF as champion. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out 
you need to get the belt off that guy and put it on a real star because he. Ain't um, well, I now would you? Here's the thing: like when you when you pour into like the the ratings data, like the more detailed stuff. Um, I mean, the real drag on their product has been the the elite and this. I mean, they've been more. They've been a drag. Like um, I'd say. Yeah, I mean, now um, has MJF knocked it out of the park from a business standpoint? No, but I don't think he's a drag. Whereas the the stuff they've been the, the elite, like when they when they were doing the six man tag team series with the who was it, the Pentagon and those guys, that was a drag. Right, you can look it up, and that actually dragged the ratings down. All right, but, um, but come on now, Rob. Are, are you going to try to tell me that the world champion should not be celebrated when business is up and should not be reprimanded when business is down? I mean, at the end of the day, they they are the company. The world um, champion is it. I'm not – I'm well, no. Uh, well, my thing is people do that very inconsistently who talk about this stuff, right? Um, and so if you're going to apply that logic, then it needs to be applied consistently and – across the board, no matter who the world champion is. Um, and most of the time, these conversations, people don't do that. They are, you know, or if business is good under a world champion or a women champion who they don't like, then they will completely downplay it or give credit to other people. And if business is bad or is declining under a world champion they do like, then they will blame it on creative or blame it on, you know, or whatever. Um, yeah, but at the end of the day, MJF does not deliver it as a world champion. He literally is, from a from a, a drawing standpoint, strictly from a drawing standpoint, not just TV ratings, we're talking merchandise, we're talking live event tickets sold, with no CM Punk, we got to see what MJF could do. And what we saw is that MJF is not a draw. Now, Jericho, Omega, with no CM Punk, those guys drew as world champion. So we got to we got to give an honest assessment of what we what we're seeing here. And what we're seeing is that MJF with the cussing and the and the and the and the terrible behavior, all that stuff is is he he bathroom humor in in short doses. But long term, you can't in this day and age, you're not going to build a company around something like that and expect to be successful. And clearly, AEW has not been successful under MJF. There's just no, there's no doubt about that. It's, 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 it's silly. You know what I mean? And, 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 and furthermore, the women's champions too. This whole nonsense of hot potato with the women's championship as the world champion has been a disaster. And the fact that Jade Cargill who I still feel is, has, a, has a, a lot to be desired in terms of actual wrestling ability, but, but let's call it what it is. You pushed her more than any other woman not named Britt Baker. So Jade Cargo should be the world champion, or at least challenging for the world championship. The fact that they haven't made that happen is just crazy. But we've seen that both world title divisions have fallen completely flat because they do not have a believable superstar in those spots. They just don't. I mean, Jesus, MJF has to wear these thick boots because he, he doesn't want to admit the fact that he's a small guy. You're a small guy. I'm a small guy. It's okay. You know what I mean? It is what it is. You shouldn't be world champion, though. I know that. You could be a nice manager. Um, wow. So, yeah. I, listen, I believe it. You, this is a re- All of you out there who think that MJF is going to be able to just waltz in the WWE and bring that character and do whatever he wants and all that other nonsense. I am giving you a reality check right now. MJF is not a star. Not in his current capacity. If you put him on commentary, if you make him a manager, he could be the next Bobby the Brain Heenan. But as a wrestler, there is no way on God's beautiful green earth or on Al Gore's internet, in a Beyonce universe, there is no way MJF should ever be the world champion in your company. Not with his cussing and carrying on. How do you market that to children? You don't. 
it's a it's nonsense. It's complete nonsense. And the fact that a guy like Powerhouse Hobbs has to sit there and catering while 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 a guy who's my size and MJF is walking around throwing drinks on kids and cussing like a lunatic and he's the world champion is a disgrace to the entire industry. So, how tall is MJF? I don't even think he's 5'8". Well, what's he what's he oh Really? I don't even think he's he's listed as 5'8", although they although uh and that was before AEW. Now they're listing him as six feet. The man ain't even five eight. I think he's 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 five seven and change. Wow. You uh, can't have a guy cussing and carrying on like a lunatic and expect to to hang that on your company. It will okay, not work. Because what well, Wikipedia says he's five foot eleven. Uh, he ain't even that. Not with those thick boots. Oh well, well look. I mean, obviously, <laughs> it's funny because well, look, look. All the 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 best height test for any wrestler is standing next to um, Charlotte Flair because she's legit five foot ten, yep. almost six feet tall, and um, basically she's kind of like the she could be like the height truth detector basically for all of these people, and. If if they're noticeably shorter than her, then yeah, then, then obviously they're they're not. That tall. I don't even <laughs> think MJF would, he would barely come up to Charlotte Flair's pecs. All right, we'll leave it at that. Uh, but you know, speaking of women's wrestling, because the, the Jay Cargo thing is interesting. We we saw that she had um, went to some non wrestling media events, and you know was turning a lot of heads. She she stacks statues. She's beautiful. Yeah. She. Uh, is an excellent communicator. So in terms of interviewing her, she she's somebody who's very interesting to interact with for sure. And she jumps out of the out of the uh, screen. There's no question about that. Um, she had made the comment that she's enjoying her time away from pro the pro wrestling bubble, and she just may stay where she's at. And then someone said AEW made you a star, and she said no, I was a star before AEW. Just people like you didn't know who I was, but that doesesn't mean I wasn't known, which you know she kind of has a point. She had far more followers on on social media than most of the aew roster before she came to aew. She had her own established brand. So when you look at stuff like that, I look at it like, hey, this could be a great storyline. Hollywood Jade, you know what I mean? That would be fantastic. But I get the impression that this isn't that she's actually being genuine and this isn't part of some storyline. I think she's fed up with the nonsense. What say you, Rob? Well, it's very interesting because, <clears throat> okay, from all, I mean, just from what anecdotal evidence I think you piece together, she's not particularly interested in working like a WWE kind of schedule. And I think that's probably the th- thing that keeps her from going there. And, and look, I mean, WWE is a very grueling schedule. If you are making good money outside of WWE and you are making good contacts, contacts and, you know, raising your profile, if you're doing all of that stuff outside of WWE and, and you're doing it to your own satisfaction, you really don't need to go there. So, you know, she may never go there because she just doesn't feel the need to. Um, and so now AEW, you know, basically she, it looks like she gets the kind of schedule that is preferable to her working in AEW, but she doesn't need to be there either, uh, apparently. So, um, I mean, has she gotten better in the ring than she was? Okay, sure. Um, is she ever going to get the amount of time to become a top-notch professional wrestler while working in AEW? Probably not. Okay. Um, because they should have, you know, when they signed her, they, they should have put her, before they ever put her on TV, they should have put had her do a more dedicated training program so that she would be further along when she got on TV. Um, they basically handled it the way WCW did with Goldberg. They saw money and 
they just put Goldberg out there because they saw money, right? Um, and it, it may ultimately, it, I mean, it worked great for him in the long run. Um, but, you know, the company didn't get all that they could out of him, I think, you know, because of how they did it. I think there's a similar thing here with Jade. Um, and, but Jade doesn't, I don't think the paycheck is nice, I'm sure, but she's doing fine financially without them. She's doing fine as far as her media appearances and what have you. She's doing fine without them. Um, so she, look, she's going to do probably do this wrestling thing until she doesn't feel like doing it. Um, and now as far as, I don't think AEW, I don't think Tony Khan, I don't think they have the creative capacity to craft um, type of storyline with her. Like I said, like doing a Hollywood Jade kind of thing would, yeah, that could that could be really good. Um, it could generate some interest. It could make some money probably. But I just don't see them doing that. And they're, I mean, they're, <coughs> their whole, um, just the way they do their whole women's division is just, it leaves a lot to be desired. Um, well, we'll table that for a second, Rob, because that takes okay. us into our, our meat and potatoes here, so to speak. That was the appetizer, everything we talked about. Um, but let's get into it. The thing that you are most world famous for is you track <laughs> how women's wrestling is being featured on television and, and who's featuring it the most, who's featuring it the least, the in-between, the whole nine yards. And I appreciate the fact that you've come on Duke Loves Wrestling through the years to update this information because it is something that I am passionate about and dedicated to. And even before you, we had other folks who were doing something similar through the years. It, since the very beginning of the show, I've always reached out to folks like yourself to track how women's wrestling is being featured on television. So, but you're, you're definitely far and away the absolute best at it and the most consistent at it. So I, I you know, kudos to you for this, this labor of love, so to speak. Um, and let me just say this before we, before I even get there. I am not against AEW. I don't want AEW to fail. Like Rob said earlier, I want AEW to succeed because there are a lot of people that we care about, including people who have been on this show, that make a living with that option. And for folks who are in other promotions, the fact that they have another place that they can negotiate off of is a big deal. And it's, a, it's the most important deal. So I don't want them to fail, but I am providing analysis on why they're not as successful as they should be. And it's not hard to see because it still comes back to, are you fulfilling the promises that you made from the beginning when you marketed this company and got people interested? Because had you not marketed the company this way, would people be as interested as they are now? Even despite the fact that it's not it's not really that good. You, we've, we've seen your ceiling. It's right around between 8, 800,000 and 900,000 people. Would you be even more popular Um or, or would you be less popular had you not lied in the beginning about how are you going to present this programming, Tony Khan? So that's what my whole criticisms are about. And certainly black male singles wrestlers, black and brown male singles wrestlers not being top contenders for the world championship. I'm on that. The other thing that I'm on equally is the entire women's division, how it's being featured in that company and beyond. And... The fact that because they only give us one women's match per wrestling televised event per week, it's not it's a no brainer to me why that division is not getting over the way that it could, because there's no lack of talent there. It's just a lack of investment by the company. That's my opinion. Now, with that said, Rob, you rank the, the wrestling shows that are on national television. Who's featuring women the most? Who's featuring women the least? So let's start from the from the top and work our way down. Who's been just just give me the just give me the uh, the rankings at first. Okay, so NXT is first. They're always first. Well, they've been first since when I started doing this in 2021. So they pulled in the first last year, and now they're they're still in first, and they're they're running away with it. I mean, to be honest, and. Uh, they have the most matches. 
they have the most women wrestling every week. They've had the most women in main events on television. Um, and even getting away from matches just into like storylines and, you know, things of that nature, they're doing more than everybody else. And <clears throat> they are the model for how you booked a women's division on a televised wrestling show. And they have been since last year. And did they do it? They didn't remember they do it in two hours. They got two hours every week. All right. Main roster WWE has five hours. AW now has five hours because the collision is two hours and then rampage is an hour. So they're doing this. In t- and, and yes, I mean, NXT is under the WWE umbrella. Yes, but they are still on television. They are still their own thing. And they're definitely being booked differently. And NXT is the winner. Um, and I do not see it changing anytime soon. And it gets kind of murky in the middle because depend um, in the middle, you have SmackDown, you have Impact, and you have Monday Night Raw. Raw is generally second, and just from a number standpoint. Um, Impact and, and SmackDown kind of, depending on the week, they kind of flip-flop here and there. And then Dynamite is last. Now I don't I don't track um, Rampage because Rampage is only an hour, and so honestly, one women if you have an hour of TV and you have one women's match, then there's not really much to glean from that. Really, there's there's nothing you can really take from that um, as far as from an analysis standpoint. Um, Collision just got started, but they only they only have one women's match. But, I mean, in three weeks, the presentation of their women, the, the one women's match has been better than on Dynamite, in my opinion. Um, we'll see how that goes going forward. So, so if we include Collision, because we have to, it's a two-hour program, which meets the criteria for what you're, you're yes. providing analysis to, Collision is ahead of Dynamite. Well, they're, they're, they're better substantively. Statistically, they they have one match a week just like Dynamite does. Got it. So, so AEW continues to invest the least in terms of presenting women's wrestling matches, storylines, and and the, and the way that they're developing the storylines in their programs. Just in general, the way that they present women's wrestling, AEW is investing the least. Yes, compared to the WWE and all their you know sub genres, their SmackDown, Raw. Uh, NXT, and compared to Impact Wrestling, AEW is at the bottom of the barrel again. Yes. Does it is is there any surprise there that they continue to hit their ceiling and that they have difficulty growing their audience? And folks, this is not just my opinion. Tony Khan has been asked about this through the years. He's commented that he wants to. At first, he said he wants to focus on their core audience, which is the key demo. And then he described what it means. He described that the people that have the most disposable income in the United States and who are generally the most educated. He's talking about white men, right? Using coded language when he could just get right to it. He's talking about white men. They focused on building an audience of white men. And unfortunately, they focused so much on just that population that they have not been able to grow in those other areas. And, right, and here's, the, here's the key. Here's the key. Here's a key. All right. They, they should be looking at areas of their programming on the, you know, where the men's side is just not doing anything. Right. It's, and you should ask yourself, why, why are you not giving the women's side more opportunities over that? Like it's, it's one thing. Look, are you going to cut CM Punk's time to add another women's match? No. Okay. The same way you don't cut Roman Reigns' time to add another women's match. You do not do that. Okay. Um, but do you look at do you look at some area of your show where things are clearly in the toilet and it would not where it at least would not hurt <clears throat> to add some women's programming instead of that? You absolutely should, right? If there's something that is, if there is some men's storyline or a group of men wrestlers or whatever, and who are just consistently week in and week out, just not delivering anything. If you can't 
you know, give your women's division some time over those guys, then that's a problem. You Agreed. Know? And, and I'll, I'll give you a great example. They accidentally found themselves a lightning in a bottle with Willow, Willow Nightingale, where she defeated Mercedes Monet, formerly known as Sasha Banks, because, you know, Mercedes got injured and she pulled a, an audible. Yes. Put Willow over <coughs> in Japan. It was well, in that Japanese show. And now you have Willow, who is a is a champion, even though it's not in your company, but she still has a championship. She's under contract in your company. She's got this this buzz going now because she defeated one of the greatest women's wrestlers of all time. Instead of wrapping her in bubble wrap and putting spikes on that bubble wrap and having her beat the daylights out of every woman in that division who is not in the title picture, giving her the greatest winning streak as a singles wrestler going, telling that story every week, in addition to other things, where you could have built up a real world title contender here, somebody credible, somebody that that the world could be following and get behind, and this could really be interesting. And then whether you want to do a, a, a dusty swerve where you want to bring Jade Cargill in and Jade costs Willow the winning the championship. And now you have a feud going with those two. So now you got two big stars where you have this, this world title level feud going on without a title. And you could still have the world champion doing whatever they're doing with whoever they're doing with. So now I just gave you two solid women's storyline going at the same time that you can feature on TV every single week and it'll generate interest. It'll generate buzz. And oh, by the way, that'll generate dollars. Yeah. And uh, Willow has an infectious, she has some real personality, right? I mean, and just kind of infectious kind of energy about her. Yeah. I mean, I look, I'm, I'm, I've been on the record. I'm not a fan of, of her wrestling style. I think she's very dangerous in the ring, especially the pounce that she does. Cause you know, there's no way for the for the the opponent to protect themselves, but that can be adjusted. Overall, everyone loves Willow. That's the first thing people say when they talk about Willow Nightingale. They say everyone loves Willow. She has, like you said, great personality. She seems like a great person based on what her peers say about her. This is somebody who you can build around, and this is somebody who, whatever rough edges there are, they can be smooth very easily. Because oh, by the way, she's been wrestling for Jesus what five six years now. So she's knocking on the door of that seven year where you should you should actually get it now. And I think she does more than most of the women on that roster. So there's no reason why you can't involve her in a major storyline and bring other people along to help make them matter as well. And by doing that, you're driving the division. Why wouldn't you do that? Uh, yeah. And um, well, they they. Exactly. Um, and but that's that requires some forward thinking. Um, a lot of times it feels like they created a women's division because they felt like they had to and not because they really wanted to. And then there are a few women there who have done well. Um, people like, you know, Britt Baker is obviously, she gets criticized a lot online. Um, she is not a particularly <laughs> great wrestler at all. Uh, I don't think it's reaching to <laughs> say that. Um, but, you know, um, but look, they, they invested in her and she did get over. Um, a lot Would of you imagine that? They invested in her. Yeah. Got over, right? So, yeah, so here's uh, the here's the same thing. When they invest in somebody, they get over to a certain degree, right? Yeah, and um, well, and, I, and look, it, it does take it, it 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 it's not just investment. They do have, the wrestler themselves does have to have something there to work with. Um, but Willow definitely does, and they they should make a bigger investment out of her than having her go out there and lose to the, the outcasts, right? Or you know. Um, and look, I'll give Tony credit for this because over because you know he you know he he runs Ring of Honor. I mean, Athena as a what was a prime example. The, the Athena they've invested in her over on Ring of Honor and look look at the results. 
I mean, she's doing it. She's doing excellent. No one watches Ring of Honor. I'm, but I'm just saying. But I'm saying. But <laughs> I'm saying. Great. But she's doing great. exactly. No, what I'm saying is that she is doing great. And if they invested in her when she was still on AEW shows, they probably would have gotten some type of return because she's somebody. Look, she came in with some WWE cachet, and and look, they totally. Now, now I do got going on a bit of a rant here. Okay. Because they totally screwed the pooch with her in AEW. She came in, she had, again, some WWE cachet. And they did actually take the time to put together a nice feud with her versus Jade and the baddies. And then when they did the match, they get they did, they give them like a four minute match on the pay per view. And that was a, that was, you want to talk about what that uh, disgusting promotional tactic of the year, that thing that Dave Meltzer has or whatever. That was a contender. Okay. Because, and look, if you're, if you, if you're worried about not having somebody who could credibly defeat Jade, Athena was right there. She is somebody who absolutely could have credibly beaten Jade in a wrestling match without Jade losing anything, right? Or without it looking ridiculous or whatever. And instead of it, or even if she doesn't beat her, you, they could have gotten a couple of matches out of that. And Jade could have come out of it looking better, you know, emerging as the ultimate winner of it even. And, but instead they went out, they, they gave them a, like a four minute match on a pay-per-view and completely just killed. It hurt both of them. Like nobody came out of that looking better. Yeah. And I, and I think that Jade's credibility overall is shot um, as a wrestler mainly because she really hasn't developed as well as you would you would hope to see somebody developed who who has access to the people she has access to so there's that but also because of the way she's been booked she 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 steamrolled the majority of the promotion and yet you never put her in the world title picture so it well, doesn't make thing. sense <laughs> it's like that too and then so it's <laughs> and again the the few times that thing with Athena was one time where they could have really, give, they could have really done something so substantive there, where again you could have gotten a couple of matches out of that between the two of them. Um, you could have given them more time, and you could have come out of it with both of them looking better than they went in. And but instead, they gave them a crap four minute match on in the middle of a pay per view, and they didn't do anything for either one of them. And then from there, it, and then it, and then from there, they went back to just you know Jace, you know, basically steamrolling the that half of the division again. And again, like yeah, they never had to go after the big title. So when she comes back from you know whatever kind of break she's taken here, are they going to do that? Because if not, I mean, what are we doing? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I just you know, but again, that that's just a complete waste of what they did there. Um, and, and you, you got this big star, and you have a world championship. She's defeated everybody. She's she she's undefeated. <clears throat> the only people she hasn't defeated is Britt Baker and and Tony Storm, right? She's yeah. defeated everybody else. So what that tells me is that you were never serious about marketing this person in the same manner that you've marketed Britt Baker. In fact. Just like you said about everything else, it almost feels like Tony Khan did that in order to quiet down critics like myself who have pointed out the 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 lack of, of commitment behind uh, wrestlers of color in that company. Well, I think Jade kind of fell into their laps, didn't they? Basically, didn't she, basically? Well, she, even if she fell in their laps, they, they, they've done a piss poor job of completing the story. It's like, don't, well, don't give her the secondary title and say, well, Negro, that's all you're going to get. <laughs> right now. Um, Cause well, the reason I'm saying that is because um, she was like a gift to them basically. And they completely squandered it. Um, and then also the fact that, like I said, like I was saying earlier, uh, it at least appears that she's not particularly inclined to want to work the WWE schedule and do the WWE kind of commitments. Well, if you can, so, if you can make enough money doing less somewhere else, then of course you're going to go for that. 
Yeah, and and what I'm saying here is though is you have somebody who is not necess- who is not necessarily inclined to jump ship on you either, right? I mean, because you know there are people there who would who would jump ship the WWE, you know, when the offer is made, right? I mean, I think look, uh, but you have somebody there who is a big star who has all this potential and who is not particularly inclined to jump ship when the opportunity comes. You should do everything you can with that person. Yeah, and and you know the the silly undefeated streak. You didn't need an undefeated streak in order to get her over. Jade Cargill can get over just by walking into a room. So we didn't need an undefeated streak. But since she did it, um, she should have never lost the title to Statlander. That didn't make any sense. And you should have just transitioned her into the world title picture and put the world title on her. And then she should have vacated the, the uh, secondary title, the TBS title. That's what, what you should have done with that, that character. Yeah. And I guess from what I heard, Statlander was always the one who was playing to beat her, but then she got injured. And so they put it off, which is silly. So Tony Khan is so committed to Statlander defeating Jade Cargill that he will sacrifice literally almost everybody else in the company just to have that result happen. And I'm sorry to say this, and I know I'm going to hurt some feelings here. How the hell has that helped AEW in any way? Because it's not like Chris Statlander is Mercedes Monet or Becky Lynch. It's not like she's set the world on fire since she's become the secondary champion, the TBS champion. And it's not like Tony Khan has invested in her in a manner that would even give her the room to set the world on fire. So uh, you, you wasted that opportunity. Yeah. No, nah, no, nah, I, I have absolutely, I have not watched Statlander enough to have an opinion of her. So I, I great, will listen, great person. Um, good wrestler. I think I, hopefully she stops taking the risk that she used to take, which resulted in injury. Um, but, I don't think the support is there in a manner that can take advantage of defeating literally one of the most protected wrestlers in the history of the company. Okay. Cause, um, cause some people have pointed out that they had had more, a few more that Statlander had been on, had more matches after winning the title than Jay had. You know. Well, not, not just that she had more matches as, as TBS champion, Chris Statlander defended the championship on AEW Dynamite more than Jade Cargill did. Okay. And <laughs> yes. what your flagship so, uh, show. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, I think the support thing you said uh, is a big point because you want know, to, like I said, as another example, like look at, you know, Austin Theory beat John Cena at WrestleMania, and ever since they've done like barely anything with them and right it's it's almost like it's not the same thing but it's a, but it does say well, well why'd you have him why'd you give him that win <laughs> right um why'd you do it if you're not going to do anything coming out of it with him really well but is they have Austin but is Austin theory hitting his metrics though um See, that's the thing. Do fans care well, enough about theory whether to boo him out of the building or whether to cheer him? In the um, I don't man, think so. I think um, Grayson Waller and what he did with Cena got over well, think, way more than anything that theory did with Cena. Uh, no, I agree totally. Um, not yeah, I agree now because well, first of all, Waller actually went back and forth with Cena, and, and Austin Theory had the deer and headlights kind of look, and um, and that doesn't help, right? It. it it doesn't if they if they put you in there with him. If they put you in there with Cena, you cannot be deer in headlights. Uh, you can't, and that hurt him a lot. And because um, actually, because just to kind of pivot, because uh, you know Naomi uh, Trinity, um, she was did an interview and she said this kind of similar thing about Charlotte. She said that if you get in there with her, it's, it's sink or swim. And. They put you in a mic session with Cena. It's a sink or swim, and if you sink, then it's not. It, you know, even if you beat him in the match, you know, I mean, it, it it's not going to do a whole. You know, you're you're going to be in kind of a not so great 
position. Um, and you saw Waller, he went in there, he, you know, he held, you know, he went back and forth with Cena. He did not look like a deer in headlights at all. And now this thing with Statlander, um, so that, yeah, I mean, they had to come out there, they had to beat Jade. And so now, like, yeah, when, so, so you need to, now you need to do whatever you're going to do with her creatively in such a way that, to make that worth it. And if you're going to, like, if you're going to have her defend the title, okay, that's great. But are you going to give her a storyline? Are you going to do any type of creative stuff with her to build on the fact that she came out there and she ended this undefeated streak and all of that? Um, right now, it doesn't really look like. Right now, they're just putting her in matches. Well said. Well said. Listen, Rob the Genius, there's a reason why they call you that. And because you know what you're talking about, but you do your research to back it up in case anybody wants to question it, including myself, which is always appreciated. Why don't you let us know, man? What's, what's the best way everyone can keep up with you and also the, the great work that you do? Okay, so I'm on Twitter at R-B-O-N-N-E-1, or Rob the Genius. Uh, and you can find my website is robsagenius.com. And so I do update my findings now, I don't update it as frequently now because I think it's kind of more important to because well, now things what's happened particularly on the WWE side now is that you will occasionally on Raw or SmackDown, particularly on Raw, you will every now and then you'll get one week where they book a whole lot of women on the episode. And if you're just if you're reporting week to week, it's very inconsistent. So I update my stuff now a little less frequently because if I did it, like for example, this week on Raw, they, they had like 12 women wrestling, right? Um, but that's an anomaly. That's not that's not the norm, right? So, it's, you know, I mean, if you're looking at everything week to week, then it's just like, oh, they did really great this week. But, you know, you got to look at the bigger picture. Um, but anyway, um, that's over at robsgenius.com. And it's called Women's Wrestling on TV in 2023. You can look up, you know, uh, my latest update. You can see how it looks, you know, six months in. And, you know, of course, you can hear me when I come on with Duke. And I'm also on the Mindless Wrestling Podcast every week with DJ and Jason. And we talk about a bunch of different pro wrestling things. And I have my own podcast, the Rob the Genius Podcast, where I talk about all types of different stuff. It's usually not professional wrestling, but I talk about a bunch of other things. So those are the many ways you can find me out here. Before I let you go real quick here, rapid fire. Uh, the latest figures for AEW Collision are out. MJF wrestled on this on this uh, episode. Yes. 455,000. Yeah, let me man, next I'm going to bring it up here so I can... Because... Uh, I do subscribe to WrestleNomics. Uh, those guys, they have some wacky opinions about stuff. <laughs> but they but they, they do but they do they provide good information. I oh, and while that. you while you're looking that up, uh, because Brendan Howard uh Brendan Thurston, he's been on the show many times through the years before AEW. And keep in mind the person that created WrestleNomics, uh Mookie, Chris Mookie Harrington, he's a VP at AEW. So part of the reason why WrestleNomics is so AEW friendly, even when they're making excuses for the missteps in AEW and why they're so critical of WWE is because WrestleNomics knows where their bread is buttered. So, you know, just want to put that in there. That's that's definitely a conflict of interest. No, no two ways about that. Yeah. Now, that being said, they do provide the, inf the statistical information they provide is good. Uh, now... So looking at the last episode of Collision, the, the highest rated part of the show was Juice Robinson versus Ricky Starks. Um, now, M now, MJF was second. Okay. So, but... The world champion was second. <laughs> yeah, so Ju Juice Robinson and Ricky Starks was the highest rated quarter hour of the show. Okay. The and world champion was second. So, there it is. And look, when... Yeah, and some people have complained a little bit about the whole Bullet Club Gold thing, but they have actually been building a feud and a story over several weeks with that for what it's worth. 
And so when you have a and so you have a match between two of the principals in that feud, and two guys who are really talented and really good at what they do. And what do you know? Highest rated part of the show. What do you know, Joe? What do you know? And look, I, and I got to say this: I was not a big Juice Robinson guy going before this, and I, I mean, he, you know, he's impressed me some with this also. So. I think it says a lot. I think it says a lot. Uh, no question about it, folks. Everything that Rob and I discussed throughout this entire hour just played out on Collision. There is a reason for this. To our live programming, you know, what does that tell you? So, anyway, as always, thank you, Rob. Hey, thank you, man. It's always a pleasure. Till next time, be kind to yourselves and be kind to others. I am the Duke. I just got canceled again. That's right. Bianca Belair is a heel. Take it away, Tony Schiavone. This is Tony Schiavone, and we're desperately out of time on Duke Love Wrestling.